Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to discuss this paper, and it's a pleasure to be here at the 25th anniversary of the ski conference. I've only been here three times, so I guess I didn't take enough uh, of the opportunities. Uh, but uh, let me talk about this paper by Lee White and Wu. Okay, so first of all, uh, Coase in the prior uh, discussion said, oh, there's no theory and I'm not happy. Well, see here, there's a lot of theory and this paper is trying to use the kind of theory in an interesting way to look at the facts. Uh, where's the clicker? Okay, uh, so I want to think a little about the kind of models we have about uh, taxes and capital structure in general. And the typical textbook models that we have are these static models. You know, we, we show M&M &M to the students, we say, oh, taxes doesn't matter. Then we do M&M &M too, and then we say, oh, taxes matters. It goes to the corner, and you say, oh, there must be something that offsets it, which is bankruptcy costs. Okay, and surprisingly, even though this is very old stuff, it's, it's a lot of what we still teach the students, okay. And then we have these kind of second generation models, which are kind of dynamic models uh, that, uh, you know, Chris Hennessy and Tony have estimated. Uh, there, we impose some exogenous constraints, there's some transactions cost of raising equity, some other constraints, and that's what's there. And then there's a third generation of models which are these kind of dynamic contracting type models. Uh, it's the kind of models that I've written with Adriano and some models that, for example, Peter has done, okay? And the static models, if you go back, um, when I read the paper, I was trying to understand what this horse and rabbit stew is. And so I said, okay, let me go back and read the Miller paper. And Miller actually complains about this idea that taxes matter. And he says, you know, uh, I've done some empirical work if the optimal capital structure is simply a matter of balancing tax advantage and bankruptcy costs, why have the observed capital structure shown so little change over time? So this is in the 70s, Miller is talking about some empirical work he did in the 50s. So he's talking about the same increase in the 40s in the uh, tax rate, which didn't lead to much of a change in the, in the leverage for a long time. And this is what Graham, Leary, and Roberts show more recently. And so he says this is this kind of, uh, it's this horse and rabbit stew, uh, which kind of relates to you're mixing two things which are supposed to be equal in proportion, but they're not, okay? Taxes are the uh, horse, it's got a big impact, bankruptcy costs is the rabbit, it's too small, this doesn't really make sense. Okay? That's his critique in some sense. And in fact, uh, if you really go back and think about, I, I have this view that what happens is, we get stuck with theories even when the facts don't justify it. So if you really look at the empirical literature and you, you look at any of these cross-sectional regressions uh, which in, involve capital structure, and there are lots of them, there are only a few things that matter, okay? Uh, if you look at Rajan Zingales, or there's even a table in Tony's paper, table two, what matters is Q, tangibility, profits, and log sales, okay? That's it, okay? Taxes never matters. The R square that it gives is extra, it's like 0 0.01. Half the time it's insignificant. Uh, so at least in the time series and the cross section, it's hard to find conclusive evidence that taxes are that important, okay? Now there's a few papers recently which have some natural experiments which claim otherwise, but overall there's a long empirical literature here and we don't find this is not like the investment cash flow relationship where you look at it and we say, okay, there's something over there. We're just not able to see this that much in the data. Okay? And so I would say that if you looked at the literature carefully, which I think a lot of us don't do, uh, what is important, taxes are important for investment. Okay, it's going to affect the marginal product of capital. It's going to affect the scale of the firm. Okay? But capital structure, remember, is a ratio. It's the amount of debt, to the amount of you know, size or total assets of the firm. You might scale down the firm, but you might also scale down the amount of debt. So it turns out it doesn't seem to matter that much. What seems to matter much more for capital structure are these variables, and one of them seems to be collateralizability. Okay. 
Okay, uh, so then I said there's a second generation of models. Leland's a big kind of paper in this. There are all these exogenous costs, they seem to have had some success. And then we have some models which are based on two sets of different constraints. So these models by, you know, DiMarzo, Fishman, Clementi, Hoppenheim, and so on, which are moral hazard and private information, so they're more agency type models. And then we have these limited enforcement models uh, that kind of go back uh, to some macro papers by Lustig and others, but more recently have been used in corporate finance by Albuquerque, Hoppenheim, Lorenzo Valentin, and more recently my work with Adrian. Okay? And there are some papers which test these models, and what Lean Whitehead is doing is testing these uh, limited uh, uh, commitment models. Okay? So what happens in these kind of in those models, as Tony showed, uh, what you have is you compare the value function which you get along the equilibrium path. So you get your profits, you get your depreciated capital, and, but you have to pay back the debt. You can walk away. And so here, in the, in, in the kind of classic macro view, if you walk away, you go to autarky <coughs> and sovereign debt. Here, when you walk away, the punishment is very weak. You walk down the road, and the only thing I can take away from you is what I can't seize. And so what you can't run away with is what is collateralizable. You can't run away with your land, your buildings, and hard assets. So you can run away with what is the soft assets, the working capital, and other things. So you can run away with output. You can run away with 1 minus theta k into 1 minus delta. Those are the soft assets. You can't run away with the collateralizable hard assets. And since the value function is monotone, if you rewrite this, what you get is this collateral constraint. Uh, this is a state contingent constraint. So in every state of the world, you could have a different amount of debt, but it has this fixed amount of collateral. Okay. And the nice thing about this is this is analytical. It, you get some implications out of this. Okay. So what is the problem you get? And I'm just going to show you the problem without taxes. This is in, in Tony's notation. You're maximizing the dividend, that's what this is, W minus K minus uh, plus the borrowing you make, uh, and you're maximizing the future value function, subject to the state contingent collateral constraint, and subject to the fact that the output tomorrow is, uh, uh, you got the output, you get a depreciated capital, and it looks like I made a typo, I just wanted to put the debt you're paying back, this is supposed to be the model without taxes, okay? And uh, the implications you get out of this, which are kind of important to get some intuition, is at low net worth, you hit against this collateral constraint, for sure, okay? You don't have any slack debt capacity or hedging, uh, but at higher net worths, you could keep some slack. The question is, do you keep it in the low stats of the world or the high states of the world? If it, what matters are cash flows, cash flows are low in low states, you might keep some spare debt capacity in those states. But if what matters is investment opportunities, investment opportunities are positively persistent, you get more investment opportunities in high states, you'd keep the slack in those states. Okay? And we'll see in Tony's empirical work, it seems as if there's more flexibility in the debt capacity in the high states. Okay, okay uh, so then you, you introduce taxes. So taxes have two effects here. One, of course, taxes reduces Output, you get the one minus TC. Okay. The other way, the other aspect of taxes is we get a tax shield. Okay. And it's kind of introduced in a little different way here. It says, what do we do in the standard textbook? We say, okay, B is the amount of debt I have, little r is the interest rate I paid. So the tax shield is the tax rate times the interest rate times the amount of debt I have. Okay. Now, if, the, if, if 1 plus R is the one period discount factor, I'm going to call it capital R, I'm getting this tax shield one year from now. I'm going to discount it back today. I'm going to get R inverse of this tau C R B, okay? And you can rewrite this as tau into 1 minus R inverse B, but then you realize what Tony calls B C is just R inverse, and you get that transfer payment over there, okay? So essentially, the transfer payment that she has to the firm is essentially what we would calculate as a tax shield. And the nice thing it does is it allows her to keep the limited enforcement and have the, the two models to be equivalent, so it keeps the micro foundation. 
Okay? So then you get this problem, and you get two equations. You get the investment Euler equation, where you'll see taxes do matter, because the marginal product of capital is affected by tau c, and you get this debt borrowing equation. Okay? And there, it's, it's not so clear whether taxes matter or not. Taxes matter here, but it turns out taxes also affect what the future marginal cost of value of net worth is and what the current marginal value of net worth is. So there's some hidden endogeneity here which you kind of, kind of have to work through. Okay. So, uh, so, so essentially, what are the empirical results? And I'm going to go into this very briefly because you think Tony did a good job. Uh, you do it with and without taxes, you get the same results. Taxes do reduce the scale of the firm because it lowers your investment, but the capital structure remains virtually the same. And if you do 24 two digits industry, you get the same effect. Leverage is highly correlated with tangibility, though on average firms do reduce debt capacity. That's the figure she showed. That's my iPhone taking a picture. So you can see <laughs> it didn't do it as quite as well. Uh, so what, what's happening? Okay. So, so the real thing is, why does taxes not have much of an effect on capital structure? Okay. So if it were the case that the collateral constraint was binding, the intuition would be very clear. Because in that case, the tax advantage of debt, in my notation, would be R into tau C into B, or Q in their notation. So remember, if you're looking at capital structure, you're looking at a ratio. You're looking at K by B, which is the total investment to B, or K by Q. But that's proportional to R by TC. So if I change TC, I get an effect which is proportional to little r, which is very small, like 4% or something. Okay? So when the collateral constraint binds, the tax effect is not very big. Okay? But of course, uh, empirically, it seems as if the collateral constraint doesn't always bind. It binds in some states of the world, for low states. So there, it's a little harder to see what's happening. Uh, so if you look at a mature firm, mu is equal to 0. So the marginal value of net worth today is 1. And you're not, you're, the collateral constraint is not binding, so that lambda is zero, you get this kind of uh, equation where the left-hand side, you can see, is independent of Q, which is the amount of debt, but the right-hand side isn't. And the key intuition, and I wasn't sure I saw this proved, is that mu is convex in, 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 in the net worth, and hence in B, and if you're at low tax rate, there's a significant effect because you're still not in the convex portion, but if you're at higher tax rate, this convexity kicks in, and then variations tax rates don't have much effect. Okay. So really, why does that happen? Okay. So the, the, the flexibility value here comes from what? Suppose I borrow more today. What's the negative of that? I have to repay it tomorrow. That means in the state of the world where I repay it, I have less net worth. Okay. So borrowing, borrowing today is good. I invest more. But I land up in some important states of the world in low net worth. And so if, it is, if I start borrowing more and more, what's happening is in those states, I'm landing up with less and less. And the convexity means that uh, the marginal value of net worth tomorrow is going up more and more. And consequently, I don't want to add on to the debt today because it has its adverse effect. Okay? So that's the financial flexibility she's, she's talking about. And what's happening, or it seems to me, is that taxes do scale down the firm, but they don't seem to change very much the trade-off in financial flexibility. Because what is the tax effect to date today? It reduces my net worth today. But it also reduces my net worth in the future. So I'm, it, the marginal value of wealth today is increased. The marginal value of wealth tomorrow is increased. I still land up with the same trade-off. I land up roughly scaled down with the same proportion of debt. And the argument which is made is you get about 7% of assets, which is these dynamic flexibility, which is around 5 to 10% of that. Okay. So that seems kind of, uh, so this is where the argument is uh, that's, uh, that's being made. So where does this go, go back to the Miller argument? Okay. I'll be done in a second. So Miller says, look, you have these Bankruptcy costs versus taxes. I mean, this is a bad idea. Bankruptcy costs are just too small. And so what this paper is arguing is 
once you allow for collateralizability, which is clearly important to cross-sectional data, and it turns out to be important in this, we do have something going on. So collateralizability is like the elephant in the room, and I owe this to my co-author for suggesting this idea. We all know that collateral matters. It's always been there. But we've never kind of explored what its implications are. And once we allow for collateral constraints and tangibility matters, we do get this dynamic flexibility. So now the trade-off is more balanced. It's not this horse and rabbit stew. And I think, therefore, you get a better answer. So I think it's a very nice paper. Uh, what I like is you take theory very seriously. You get some interesting implications for and puzzle, which has been around for 20, 30 years. Uh, and I think this will have substantial impact. Thank you.